So, hi. I'm not Heineck, by, but Hinek. <laughs> and um, you may know me from the internet where I look like this, and I'm squatting most of the uh, Hinek accounts all over the internet. Um, other places you, can, you may know me from is here. Um, yes, just, I just heard the um, your Python veterans. And uh, when I'm not doing even that, I'm doing infrastructure at Varu Media, which is a small but friendly uh, German web hosting company down in Potsdam, just a few train stations away from here. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about myself. I'm here to tell you that those shiny icons that promise you that you're safe because of military-grade encryption are a lie. So um, this statement may, may have been a bit more controversial a few years ago, before Mr. Snowden, before the current onslaught of OpenSSL bugs, it feels like every week is something new. But I assure you that those problems are much, much older. Uh, we, we knew about the sorry state like 10 years ago, but nobody cared because we were just tinfoil hat wearing nerds. Uh, TLS was just there in our browsers. OpenSSL was open source software, so what could possibly go wrong? Oh. The problem is that you really need to know how things fit in together and how everything is working in order to assess the risks, because there are always risks, and how to minimize them. Because you can do much more damage than any bug and open source ever will if you just repeat some very um, popular mistakes that are done every day. So, but before we uh, get into those, let me introduce you to the only link you will have to write down today. Um, every other link, every other project, every other concept will be there. So, uh, so just for now, lay back, relax, and enjoy the talk. And we will start at ground zero. Why is this a state of SSL story? And what actually is SSL? And what the hell does it have to do with TLS? And I think this question is best answered with a short history lesson, because everyone loves history lessons. And our particular one starts in the mid-90s, when Netscape started to thinking that it would be nice if entering your credit card number on the internet would not entail people buying drugs out of your pocket. And so they introduced SSL2, which was completely host, as the, um, as the basis for HTTPS, where the S is standing for secure, not SSL. Um, they fixed the worst warts a year later uh, in SSL3. And another three years later, and after a brief uh, battle with Microsoft, it finally became a true IETF standard. And it was renamed to TLS, Transport Layer Security. So just to reiterate, SSL is a product from Netscape from 1996. TLS is an internet standard for 15 years now. So, uh, basically, I tricked you in here with the name. But since everybody knows that alliterations are always awesome, and uh, I wanted to reach everyone I could, so I used the most used keyword. So, uh, if I had to trick you in here, I hope you learned a first thing today and will not say SSL in the future anymore. So, 2006 and 2008, the widely ignored TLS 1.1 and 1.2 have been released. They both fixed uh, some serious problems. They added really nice features, but nobody cared. Fast forward to last year, where for some totally random reason, people start scrutinizing our security habits again. And it turns out what I found was not entirely good. Um, so for example, all browsers had supported only TLS1 until 2013, so TLS1 from 1999. But the discoveries of 2013 changed everything. Uh, the times were just saying that something contains SSL or TLS uh, that it would be enough are gone. So, and um, you really need to know roughly what you're doing uh, because this technology has really sharp edges still. I hope this will change in the near future, but for now you have to know what you're doing and how things fit together. So what does TLS actually want to provide you with? So there's peer identity using certificates. You can verify when you connect to a host who this host is. I know some group would trick you into connecting to their own server pretending to be you. So that protects you against man in the middle or MITM attacks. Then there's confidentiality, which is basically encryption of the network traffic, which means that uh, 
people can't eavesdrop on your on your password secrets and everything. This is what most people think about when they hear cryptography, TLS, SSL. But you see it's only a third, because the third thing is integrity, which ensures that you can detect if TLS records get lost, mangled, or arrive multiple times, which is just as important as the other two things. So now we know roughly what we are working with. Let's see um, how to use those and explain further details along the way. So after this part, you will know what um, the smells of poor TLS usage are and what to avoid. And we will start with servers. And unless noted, I'm sticking to OpenSSL throughout the rest of this talk because that's what you'll be most likely using, especially on servers. And if you're deploying servers, it's more or less your duty to um, ensure the, the best possible security for users because they can neither see nor affect your own setups. So the first step is to use at least halfway up-to-date software. And if you deploy anything older than this today, you are being negligent, lazy, and stop doing so. But I'm generally assuming that you are using some distribution which backports security patches. Because unless you don't have that, there's no way you use anything older than, a, than the very newest versions. Because new versions come out for a reason, especially for OpenSSL. So if you compile yourself, you have to stay on top of it unless you want a bleeding heart. So the first thing you do if a client connects to you is that you send them your certificate, which um, says who you are. In order for the client to actually believe what the certificate says, it has to be signed by a trusted third party, which is called a certificate authority or a CA. So the set of all CAs that the client trusts is called a trust database. And it's located either in a browser or in a or in the operating system. Depends on which browser you're using or what software in general you're using. So to prove that this certificate is actually yours, because you're setting it to every, sending it out to everyone who ever connects, a secret key belongs to each certificate, which in turn is used for signatures, which in turn can be verified using a certificate. And so you can prove that uh, you're actually in the possession of the secret key, or, and thus that you can be trusted with uh, the certificate you have um, just sent to the client. Your job now is it to make your uh, certificate setup trustworthy. Because your TLS is worthless if um, there's no way for the client to determine who you actually are. And you will not get a certificate signed directly by a, a trusted third party, um, but you will get a so-called chain file along with your certificate. So for example, in this case, the trusted, third, uh, the trusted CA, Ed Trust, signed some certificate for uh, Komodo, which in turn signed some other Komodo certificate, which in turn finally signed my certificate. So whenever a client, in this case, is a homepage, so a browser connects, it will receive all three certificates. And then figures out the path to the secure one. So um, take care of the trust chain. Forgetting chain certificate is a typical rookie mistake. Ensure the certificate is valid for the host name of your server. And of course, make sure that your cert certificates are not expired because that's kind of embarrassing. So, and disable SSL2. Chances are that's not necessary, but for instance, uh, Apple's uh, SSL, OpenSSL still needs that. Not that I would be suggesting that deploying servers on OS X is a good idea because it's not, don't do it. If you don't have to support Windows XP, uh, you can also drop SSL3. And finally, disable TLS compression to avoid crime attacks. So the first and the last usually is patched into your OpenSSL, so you don't have to do it yourself, but you have to verify that it's actually happening. So the next objective is to configure your Cypher suite such that every client gets the best possible encryption. And a Cypher suite is just a tuple of uh, various um, cryptographic primitives that I used to secure a connection. And ultimately, the server has the last say which one is used. So use this power for good. And we will start with Cypher themselves because they're easiest to explain. Just imagine them as black boxes that take plain text data in and a key, secret key. And they 
gives, give you a cipher, a cipher text back, which should be indistinguishable from random data. So, TLS ciphers are symmetric. That means that if you want to decrypt your cipher text, the relevant function of the cipher needs the exact same key. This will be uh, important later on. Uh, this is pretty much straightforward. It gets a bit more complicated because most ciphers are block oriented. That means they operate on a certain block size, usually 128 bits nowadays. So you can't just put a one gigabyte move in, into it and wait for the ciphertext to come out on the other end. If the data is uh, bigger, you have to chop it up. And if it's smaller, you have to pad it. So in practice, you usually do both. Um, the most common way to do that is nowadays still uh, so-called cipher block chaining or CBC which unfortunately has been implemented very poorly in TLS, which bestowed us with a wide variety of uh, attacks and problems, Beast being the most uh, famous one. So, they have been fixed in TLS 1.1, but you may remember what people did to TLS 1, ignore it. So, other alternatives which have been employed actually are as client-side fixes. Every, every browser is full of fixes for all possible bugs that may be encountered on a server. And stream ciphers like RC4 in the past and uh, ChaCha20 in the hopefully near future. And finally, TLS 1.2 brought a shiny new mode called the Galois counter mode, which does much more than chopping and padding, but more on that one later. So now we know what a cipher is. So which one to use? And this is a question of a lot of contention. And the correct answer is none. But um, sourcing some practical opinions, I'm, I'm going to say that the best current ciphers are AES-128 in Galois counter mode and the stream cipher ChaCha20 from Dan Bernstein. And uh, AES in GCM is really, really great in hardware and ChaCha on the other hand is really good in software. So ideally you support both and let the client decide which one to use, which is exactly what Google does. Unfortunately, it's not uh, available to us mere mortals yet, so AES in JCM it is for now. But even for the latest Safari and IE browsers, you still have to fall back to AES CBC. It's the same cipher, just a different block mode. Uh, and it's completely fine on TLS 1.2. So if you don't trust Intel's AES GCM uh, chips because they are backdoored by um, all the agencies, uh, you can still use this as a favorite cipher. It's not a, not a problem. It's just, yeah, it's a bit uh, sl slightly uh, slower. But it's absolutely terrible on TLS 1. So but you don't have really any choice here other than hoping that the client contains fixes for their mode based attacks. So if you need to support ancient clients like Windows XP, I would suggest to use triple less, which is decent. So decent in the sense that it's secure enough. However, a three means that the DES cipher is used three times. So you can imagine how, um, how fast that one is. And that's it. Uh, you don't need anything else that, to support everything you may encounter on the net. And be especially wary of the following ones. Export ciphers have been intentionally weakened um, in times when the uh, export of uh, cryptographic software from the US was uh, severely restricted. So these ciphers are backdoored by design. What's also not, not uh, usable anymore is DES, which is not, as far as I know, backdoor, but it uses 56-bit keys and it can be brute forced um, without much effort. And finally, there's my little favorite called RC4, which is, seems to be a bit more complicated, but in reality, it really is not. While some people are still claiming that it is the silver bullet for all mode-based uh, problems, all notable cryptographers I know of have been suggesting for years that RC4 may be uh, flawed in ways that national agencies may be uh, able to decrypt it. So, um, and people with access to the Snowden files have finally confirmed this suspicion last year. So, but it's fast, am I right? In order to encrypt and decrypt, ciphers need a key. And as we've already established, we use symmetric ciphers. So you need the same key for both operations. So we need a way to agree on encryption keys over a yet to be encrypted, um, um, yet to be encrypted connection, which kind of sounds like a chicken egg problem. 
But fortunately, Math came to the rescue and gave us several ways to establish keys or an insecure connection without actually leaking them. So, three of them are currently widely deployed and the probably most famous one is RSA, which is not just a company that took uh, several bags of money from the NSA, but also a public key crypto system. So, you have a public key and a private key, public key for encryption, private key for decryption, simple. It is fast, that's why ops really like it, but as soon as the secret key bleeds out, out of the server, all future and past communications become plain text to the attacker. We say it lacks perfect forward secrecy or that it is not PFS. And this bears really repeating. It's one court order, one CVE, or one server break-in. That is all it takes, and such that the thief can decipher everything they've captured capture or ever will capture. And there's no way for you to know whether this is happening. Then there's um, the ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, which is PFS, but slow. It has been uh, around a while, but people were reluctant to deploy it because slow. Fortunately, now we have ECDHE, which is both fast and PFS. Unfortunately, it's still not completely, fully, uh, widely uh, supported, but we are getting there. Well, now, do everything humanly possible to ensure perfect forward secrecy for as many clients as possible. Um, I find it even more important than using the right cipher. And for that, you will have to support both DHE and ECDHE. And since ECDHE is faster, I would suggest that you prefer it. Use RSA only as the last option, only if you have to. Finally, message authentication codes, or MACs, are used for message integrity. So messages in TLS context just means a TLS record, just a lump of data that you sent out and received and worked on. MACs are not TLS specific. And they combine some magic crypto dust with shared secret keys to ensure both the integrity and uh, the authenticity of single messages. So we know that this exact message, as we have it, was sent by the person who knows the shared secrets key in that order. And TLS uses a so-called keyed hash mag, or just HMAC by default. So you may all heard these terms, so maybe now things are kind of falling into place. And before that, SSL used something similar, but uh, different. If your connection is secure, the traditional cipher you can even define the function, the hashing function you can, that is gonna use for the HMAC. And um, there's nothing you can really do wrong, like dangerously wrong. Uh, but I like to disable MD5 HMACs because they really irk me. It doesn't suffer from the usual uh, MD5 collision problems like the vanilla MD5, but it's MD5 and I like short cipher lists. Finally, TLS 1.2 introduced the possibility of uh, that ciphers bring their own message authentication. And uh, this is where the aforementioned GCM is interesting because this block mode has message authentication built right in, so it's not an additional operation. It is handled within the uh, encryption and decryption. So finally, if your list does not contain only strong PFS ciphers, make sure to configure your server that it, sorry, that its own cipher preferences have a higher priority than the clients. Because the most up-to-date TLS implementations on both sides won't bow you anything if the client sends a list of, with uh, RSA triple dash at the top and you obediently comply, although you could have had ChaCha20 or whatever the future brings. And there are actually downgrade attacks that can make such things happen. So, you are basically done. If you do what I've told you on the past slides, you're fine and way ahead of the average. Everything else is just minutia. However, you have to test your, um, your setup. Because um, there's really some confusing stuff going on, like on RHEL 6.5 or CentOS 6.5, the OpenSSL does support ECDHE. However, their engine X has been compiled against an older OpenSSL, which means that it does not expose it to the clients. So if you just look on the server and play with your cipher strings, you will have the impression that everything is fine, but from the outside, it's actually not. So you always have to test your system from the outside. And um, if your server is just HTTPS, uh, which I'm gonna assume, it's your lucky day, 
because then you can just use the excellent SSL server test from uh, Qualys. And I'm going to sh just show you the output for my homepage and help you um, to just read the results. And I would like to stress that they test many more things that I'm going to talk about, but I don't, I'm very tight on time anyway, but do the basics, get back to the page and uh, make sure as, <clears throat> as much as uh, possible is green. Always aim for an A+. Plus. It's not that difficult. So, certificate. This one is um, valid for my homepage, both with and without the triple W. It's valid from this March until next May. And the key is an RSA, uh, it's a 4K RSA key, which means that it uses RSA for uh, cryptographic signatures, not for key exchange. It's the same algorithm, but a completely different use case with different implications. So other possibilities are DSS, which nobody uses, and ECDSA that is gaining some traction, but is still under supported by both clients and CAs. So if you want to be avant-garde and deploy ECDSA, you have to pay a lot more for your certificates and you have to do a dual certificate setup like Google is doing right now. So as for RSA keys, 4K is the current state of the art. So if you're deploying new certificates, you should aim for that. 2K is barely enough, but most common right now, 1K is a serious uh, security problem. So it was issued by Komodo and they signed it with SHA-2, which is nice because again, this is what you should strive for. Most certificates nowadays are still signed with SHA-1, which has been deprecated even by the NIST. So yeah, it has no extended validation because I think it's just a huge racket to make loads of money and it's not revoked, it's trusted, yay. Protocols, ensure always that TLS 1.2 and 1.1 are active and SSL2 inactive. If you're in an unlucky position like I am, you have to keep SSL3 on, but if you can, drop it. And now, finally, for a <coughs> cipher suits. Here it is, the currently best widely uh, supported cipher string um, you can have, and we'll look at it in detail. So it uses the fast and forward secure ECDHE for um, key exchange, the OK uh, RSA for signatures, which is uh, predefined by the certificate. You cannot configure this one. Um, yeah, the cipher itself, AES128 in GCM mode. Nice, nice. And SHA-256, which is a SHA-2 um, algorithm, is used for key derivation on a, on a TLS handshake. If there would be an external HMAC, so if you, were, if you weren't using GCM, this function would also be used for uh, the, would be used for the HMAC, yeah. So, please note that the server strictly prefers um, forward secure ciphers over non-forward secure one. And even say so that there's a ser server preferred order. This is really important. Um, Again, if you can drop RSA, you only need it for old, old windows. However, this is a rather privileged view for browsers because um, compared to many mail server setups and old Java versions, IE6 can look like a sweet dream. So uh, you, know, you have to look what works for you and what your clients are. And speaking of clients, let's talk about them. And it turns out the browsers aside, uh, the client side of TLS is in the worst shape of all, which is Kind of surprising because they have only one single job. Verify. Verify the certificate the server sends you. Is it valid or is it expired? Does the trust chain validate? And finally, is the certificate valid for the host you wanted to actually connect to? Especially hostname verification is in such a pathetic state that there's an actual scientific paper about how client software, except browsers, does not verify host names. And unfortunately, OpenSSL has no little part in a status quo. So we'll start with a trust chain. First thing is that certificate verification is opt-in. And guess what? You have to tell OpenSSL explicitly which CAs you trust. Unfortunately, trust stores are highly platform dependent. Every OS has it elsewhere. Fortunately, there is 
a, a function call that will uh, that on properly configured computers um, will load the default trusted CAs from compiled in path. But for some odd reason, this function is completely undocumented in OpenSSL. And it also only works with file and directory based uh, trust databases. So it will not work with Windows or OS X. At least not with the OpenSSL that's shipped with OS X. So, and it, as if OpenSSL's uh, obstacles weren't obstaclish enough, uh, the operating system vendors decided to make our life even a bit more miserable by not installing them by default. So, make sure you install your, C, your trust databases before you try to use them. So, for FreeBSD, it's CA root NSS. And for both Debian and Red Hat, it's CA certificates. Now, oh, some consistency finally. On OS X, you can either use uh, Apple's ancient OpenSSL, which you shouldn't, and figure out the quirks of their patched in uh, trust evaluation agent, which cost two weeks of my life. Or you go for Homebrew, which will give you a decent, uh, the, the latest OpenSSL, and on installation, it will create a copy of the system trust database and use that for um, in the future, which and then it works with the API call I mentioned before. It's not perfect, but it's yeah about as good as we will get. Um, fine. For Windows, there's WinSert Store. I see the author of it even sitting here. Hello. <laughs> and uh, finally, if you want to dodge the bullet completely, you can just use Serify, um, which is a Python package of Mozilla's trust database, um, and it, it's kind of belongs to the requests project, but it has been externalized and it now is uh, under good support. So, uh, so op ops don't really like it when you use your own trust database, but if you don't have the knowledge and energy to figure out all these cases, you may want to just go the cheap way. So, hostname verification. I say it's even worse. And the problem here is because OpenSSL just says you. There's frankly absolutely no assistance from OpenSSL whatsoever to verify whether a certificate is valid for a host name. Nothing. There isn't even any documentation on that because they just consider it out of scope. So whatever. Um, so everyone has to implement it on their own using RFCs and bogus advice from Stack Overflow. And of course, it's raining security bugs. And Python was involved too in one, so at least one, one that I know of. So, but failing to verify certificates and host names has very grave consequences because it makes you extremely susceptible to MITM attacks. If you don't verify anything, which is the default behavior, if you don't anything special, I can pretend to be a Google um, with a self-signed certificate I can create in under a second. If you verify the certificate because you found somehow the API calls, but you don't verify um, Oh, sorry, I don't verify the host name. I can still be your Google because it's perfectly trust. Uh, I can use just my own certificate from my own homepage, which will work because it's perfectly trustworthy. It's signed by a trustworthy um, CA, but not for the host name. But you will not know because you didn't look. So again, verify all the things. If there's only one thing you take away from this call, talk is that if you write TLS client software, always verify everything. Any other way, you are pretending a level of security which is not just, just not there. And the rest is just mundane. You limit your acceptable ciphers to strong ones for times of poorly configured servers. I heard there are some out there. And disable SSL2. That's all. And yet, so few do it. It's a perfect storm of ignorance on one side and operating systems and open SSL making it unnecessarily hard on the other. And Let's continue with the users, the weakest link of the security chain. Because they can make everything fall apart, no matter how much the rest of the stack tries to keep them secure. And it starts with fundamental misconceptions about what TLS even wants to do for you. So for example, it's nice that your connection to your chat or email server is encrypted with the latest and greatest cipher. It's awesome, keep doing it. But if the other person you're talking to is connected using a Plantex connection, or some intermediate server is compromised, uh, your confidentiality level for this uh, 
conversation is exactly zero. And since, again, there's no way for you to know where this is happening, you have always to assume the worst. TLS only offers security between direct hosts. And if you additionally need a confidentiality for, a, for, for an end-to-end -end conversation, you will need an end-to-end -end protocol like PGP for email or OTR for chat. And then there's the problem of some, that some data cannot be encrypted. For example, DNS queries. If you are, surf, if you are surfing, um, for example, a job site at work you, over HTTPS, there are still many ways for IT to find out that you're doing just that. There are traffic patterns, DNS queries. There's a lot of stuff going on that you cannot hide. You will have to use a VPN or something similar. But a VPN routes all your traffic through the network of your VPN provider, so you better make sure that you trust them. And this applies even more, even stronger to content delivery networks because they do the TLS termination for you. They see the traffic in clear text. So in other words, um, Fastly could sniff out all your PyPI passwords if they wanted to. And this is another reason to never reuse passwords because you never know what third party you may not even not know about gets to see it. So next, if you ever clicked away something like this, you may have been MITM'd. And the rule is pretty simple. Investigate the warning and then use your best judgment. So if the certificate is okay but expired five minutes ago, it's time for a snarky tweet, but uh, you're probably fine. If it's mostly okay, but um, you notice circumstances, for example, a tool that still doesn't properly support SNI in 2014, you're, a, you're a probably fine too. I would avoid the snarky tweet because you might get the ticket um, uh, redirected to you. Um, and again, use your, use your mind. If, if you don't fully understand what's going on here, just decline. Man in the middle attacks are probably much easier than you think, especially in public networks. It, all it takes is a rogue DHCP server. So in the next level of clicking mindlessly is if some crook tricks you installing their root certificate into your trust database, because that means that every certificate that is signed by this crooked uh, CA will be considered uh, trustworthy by your system or your, by your browser. So you will never ever see a warning again when they MIT you. And sometimes it sounds more initious, like um, on the iPhone it's called, I think, profiles or something like that. If you install a profile, you, st you, you can get some CA uh, uh, trust changes too along the way and you will not really know. And even if the user doesn't screw up, there's still a lot that can go wrong because the trust database isn't really under their control. And they usually can add things, but they usually don't remove things or maybe they even can't remove things. And there are some CAs that may cause some level of discomfort to you. So for example, this means that the Department of Defense of the United States of America can sign a certificate for any host name in the world and it will be trustworthy. And this is not an American thing. China is right up there and just as everyone else. Every single country in the world has some CA they can abuse for some, uh, for some of their uh, nefarious reasons. So, And it's also not unheard of CAs being hacked, making fatal mistakes. You may have heard of it, I think it's like two weeks ago, when this Indian CA started, um, started deploying um, Google certificates. Or they are forced to uh, cooperate with um, with authorities, and there, maybe they're just corporations whose priorities may not entirely match yours. For example, Microsoft is a CA, Google's a CA, whatever it means to you, but this whole system is just broken. And speaking of broken, let's talk about Python now. Let's start with a simple rule of thumb. As you've seen, people love to screw up um, TLS. So if it's somehow possible, let battle test that software do it for you. Put an Nginx in front of it, put an Apache in front of it. There's a lot of information how to get it right. Those people, this uh, stuff is just uh, properly reviewed. People use it all late. This is not true for some Python module. It's just edit uh, some API calls because someone asked on it on a bug tracker. But let's see anyway what to do. So. We have basically two camps for TLS. 
We have the standard libraries SSL module and we have PyOpenSSL. And we will start with the included batteries, which are pretty rusty in everything before Python 3.3. <laughs> and due to backward compatibility requirements, the default behavior on 3.4 is still terrible. So for example, host name verification is still opt-in, although the code is there. But it cannot be active by default because people would cry because their badly deployed TLS stacks would break. That's a situation you wished for in Python 2, though, because its coverage of OpenSSL APIs is very, very poor. So for example, it's impossible to write forward secure servers. So in other words, you should never write servers with a standard libraries SSL module before Python 3.3. And uh, it also lacks a bunch of options, so you can't disable um, SSL2, you, you can't uh, disable TLS uh, compression, stuff like this. Another drawback is that you're bound to the open SSL of your, uh, that your Python has been compiled against. So if you need a more recent open SSL or th anything, you will have to recompile your whole uh, Python, <coughs> your whole uh, yeah, Python interpreter. What's also completely missing from Python 2 is hosting verification, but unfortunately it's on PyPI, so there is a way to do it for client software, but hands up if anybody knew of that and have actually used it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was very few hands, and one of the hands actually implemented it. <laughs> so, PyOpenSSL. It comes from a time when the standard library's TLS support was even worse than what we have in 2.7 today. And it runs on all relevant Python versions, and although it has been a bit dormant over the course of time, it still has a much, much better coverage of the APIs than um, the SSL module in Python 2. And more importantly, a new project gave PyOpenSSL a new vigor after 10 years or so, PyCAS cryptography. What is it? It's a bunch of Python people with more time and sense and a knack for bad <coughs> life decisions that came together to create a Python crypto library without fruit guns. And eventually the Python Cryptography Authority, or PyCA, has, in short, has been formed around of it. And a side product um, of that um, is, were CFFI bindings, which are PyPy friendly. And what's even nicer, is that you can choose an alternative OpenSSL without any problems. Uh, secure transport backends are in the works, so we all get our heart bleeds, uh, no, our uh, good or fail in Python 2. And what's really nice about the whole thing is that PyOpenSSL could just throw out all the C code they've ever used. It's, it's, just, it's now a pure Python project, which just, is just building Python abstractions on top of a C API that's coming from elsewhere. So it gave some real momentum after it languished for several years. But again, no hostname verification. So, again, help us on PyPI, service identity will give you hostname verification, plus some more obscure ways to verify the identity of a service, which you will probably never use, but they are defined in an RFC, so there it is. Again opt-in, you have to remember to use it. And we will look now at the most common frameworks and packages on how well-behaved TLS citizens they are. I will start with servers again. So, Eventland, GUent, GUnicorn, and Tornado all suffer from the same problem. They use the standard libraries as SSL module, therefore they cannot have PFS ciphers, they cannot set connection parameters. Tornado could read theoretically on Python 3, but they don't. GEUN has some code in place that will maybe arrive in the next um, feature release, but until then, put an Nginx in front of all of them. Twisted is probably one of the few legit reasons to cope with TLS in the first place, because it's used for, uh, to implement all kinds of protocols. So, uh, not just HTTPS, but this, all these check marks are true only from 14.0, which was released a few months ago. So you do yourself a favor, don't use anything older. And a little known fact is that Twisted ships with a nice whiskey container. So in other words, you can deploy HTTPS web apps um, without putting anything in front of it and still have ACE TLS support. And no, deploying whiskey apps on Twisted does not mean that you have to use callbacks or camo case. It's all good. So there's finally micro whiskey. Uh, it's not Python specific, so they just went and wrote some C code themselves. 
uh, that made them the masters of their own fate. And indeed, their implementation appears to be um, fully featured. And I would still always put an Nginx in front of it, but that's only because I have a general distrust towards OpenSSL using uh, C code, and so should you. Um, finally, micro risky. No, sorry, I'm, I've slipped. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. These daggers, they are gonna stay as long as a certain pep hasn't passed or as long as they don't port to Python 3 or to um, PyOpenSSL. So, client side, event and G-Event, just as bad as before. Uh, you can do better, and Tornado shows how. They depend on certify, and they depend on the backports, so uh, you get all the verification by default. They still can't set certain defaults because they are they didn't appear before uh, Python 3.2. So, um, Twisted is a bit more complicated. Um, all the low-level stuff is there since 14.0, so you can write correct software. What's currently missing is uh, a proper endpoint that will do all the things by default, but we are getting there. Um, I was never getting get anywhere is ZeroLib2. Don't use it ever for any HTTPS actions. They just cannot get better. Instead, use requests to get rid of three. Um, what's really nice about requests is that it tries transparently to get the most out of it what's even possible. So they will tr use PyOpenSSL if it's there, and they will verify everything that's possible. And they even uh, ship with 35 inside of it. So let me sum it up quickly. Uh, Keep TLS out of Python if you can. Use requests for HTTPS queries. Use PyOpenSSL in, in, inside it. Um, write your TLS servers on Twisted. And if you need low-level TLS, I strongly suggest to use PyOpenSSL because it's much better on Python 2 and it will follow you faithfully to Python 3. Finally. Uh, use the Python 2 standard library only as the last measure, only for clients, and use the relevant backports. So, wrapping up, <laughs> cool up. Um, why is it sorry? So, it's sorry because people still say SSL, although it's been obsolete for 15 years. It's sorry because the implementations are terrible, all of them. It's sorry because users run outdated software, click certificate warnings away, and are at the mercy of third parties. Um, yeah, forgot to click, sorry. Um, and those third parties let them down regularly. So servers run completely outdated software that is com uh, configured completely poorly. Clients don't verify anything, although it's their only job. And we're not talking about some obscure freeware here. This January, security researchers of IOActive have found 40% of tested banking apps to be suspicious to MITM attacks. And it's sorry because Python is at the forefront of being terrible. The current state really is sorry. The title of this talk is not attention bait, but there's hope. So first, we care again, acceptance. Always the first step. The TLS support got much better in Python 3, and uh, there's even a PEP to improve retroactively uh, in uh, Python 2. So it's even possible to write secure software. Um, again, we have got the PyCar now, which is a bunch of really smart people plus me um, that has already adopted several cryptography-related projects, and it's supposed to be the one-stop shop for solid crypto software for Python. So we are really trying here. but. Hope always means work too, so stop believing that the lock icon will keep you safe. Do not click away certificates <coughs> warnings. Be a critical user. Configure your servers properly. Install security updates immediately. If you connect to servers, verify all the things. And finally, help us to get Python out of this mess. Um, fix your software, fix your libraries, report bugs, help fixing these bugs. There's really a lot to do, and there's that's all I had for you today. <laughs> I hope you learned something, and more importantly, are really eager to fix things now. So go out, study the talk page, follow me on Twitter, and get your domains from Vero Media. Thank you.